Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The program is about to begin. At this time, please turn off all electronic devices. Please refrain from using flash photography during the program. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senator Rand Paul. Good evening, everyone. My name's John Highbush, and I have the honor of being the executive director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. And I want to thank every one of you for coming out this evening. In honor of our men and women in uniform who defend our freedoms around the world, if you please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks, please be seated. Several years ago, during President Reagan's centennial celebration, we took the opportunity to survey many Americans and we asked them a simple question. What word or words do you most associate with George Washington, with Abraham Lincoln, and with Ronald Reagan? It was essentially a word association game for America's three most admired presidents at the time. The father of our country, was the top response for President Washington. Set free the slaves was the refrain for Abraham Lincoln. For Ronald Reagan, the answer was clear and near unanimous. It was a single word, and the word was freedom. Freedom and Ronald Reagan go hand in hand. Now, I have a strong feeling that if we were to conduct a similar word association test with the countless admirers of our guests this evening, Senator Rand Paul, the response would be quite simple and just as direct. In my view, the one word best used to define him and his life of public service would be liberty. It's liberty that citizen Rand Paul, that Dr. Rand Paul, that Senator Rand Paul has fought for nearly his entire adult life. This is true whether one studies his thousands of speeches or votes on the Senate floor, his campaign for the presidency in 2016, or his several books, including his newest, The Case Against Socialism, co-authored by our other guests this evening, his terrific wife of 19 years, Kelly Paul. Kelly, welcome. In fact, I think it was the cause of liberty that led 13-year-old Rand Paul to help his father, Ron, get elected to the US Congress in 1976. It was the cause of liberty that drove a young Rand Paul to attend the 1976 Republican Convention beside his father when he led the Texas delegation in support of Ronald Reagan for president that year. And of course, it was the cause of liberty that drove his own successful runs for the Senate in Kentucky in 2010 and 2016. Now, I believe Senator Paul and his wife, Kelly, would probably be among the first to say that while the cause of liberty is a just one, the fight to ensure life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as guaranteed by the Constitution for all Americans is not always easy. 
Senator Paul has often found himself at odds with others, including those in his own party, on issues fundamental to the cause of liberty, whether it involves matters of privacy and the Patriot Act, foreign policy in the Middle East, the size of the federal government, our national debt, the IRS, the list goes on. Where he is right at home most recently, where he is in perfect lockstep with the man that this library is named after, is in his fight for liberty and against socialism. As many of you know, President and Mrs. Reagan are buried at a grave site just about 100 yards from here. If by chance you have visited it recently and heard even the slightest sound, you can rest assured that's likely the sound of President Reagan rolling in his grave, <laughs> rolling over the fact that about half of today's youth, I will repeat that, half of today's youth, and a majority of Democrats in this nation now have a favorable opinion of socialism. President Reagan, like Senator Paul, spent a lifetime fighting the growing state and the power and influence that Big Brother is constantly striving to consolidate in order to rule our lives. So to quote Ronald Reagan, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. The very essence of Ronald Reagan was freedom. The very essence of Rand Paul is liberty. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage Senator Rand Paul and his wife, Kelly. Thank you. Senator, um, oh, thank you for coming. It's uh, just an honor to have you and Kelly here today. And I, before we get started, I just want to say I'm sure on behalf of everyone in this audience, I, I know that um, you've had to go through some tough medical situations and surgery recently, and we all hope and pray that you're going to be just fine. Thank you. Thank you. But you realize if you ask the left, it's all Donald Trump's fault, right? <laughs> <laughs> the left is so angry. They're attacking people. I was shot at, up at the baseball field when Steve Scalise was almost killed. But somehow it's all Donald Trump's fault that the left seems to be committing violence against the right. Yeah. Go figure. Yeah, go figure. Senator, what does it say about the state of affairs in the country today that you even have to write a book called The Case Against Socialism? That's probably one of the most common responses I get is, really, we've got to repeat the case against socialism? Didn't we already win that case? And really, for over 100 years, we did. We fought against the Marxian notion that somehow labor was being ripped off, that there was a surplus theory of value, and somehow you know, that uh, the capitalists were robbing and stealing from labor. We won that argument probably in like 1890, 1900. Von Mises writes a book, 1920, on socialism. You know, we won the intellectual argument. It's like, oh my goodness, half of the young people now say that they think they have a positive perception of socialism. And that's kind of what got us motivated. We were aghast that that could be. Now, the only one sort of saving grace, though, is that if you ask these kids who have a good opinion of socialism, what is socialism, they're like, if you ask, only about 15% of them can tell you that it's the state ownership of the means of production or the state ownership of property, collective ownership of property. They don't know what it is. And so maybe the book can have some influence on people who are thinking socialism's a good idea, but they don't seem to remember who Mao was. They don't seem to remember who Stalin was. They don't remember that Hitler was a socialist. And so our hope is in the book is to remind them of that and then sort of keep coming towards the future because what they keep saying is, oh, no, 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 we're, you know, of course we're not Hitler, we don't like Hitler anymore, and Stalin, 
Well, the left did actually like Stalin. Walter Durante, we talk, tell the story, wins a Pulitzer Prize. He, wrote for, he writes for that newspaper, what's it called? Oh yeah, the fake New York Times. <laughs> so he gets a Pulitzer writing for the New York Times and in that, uh, he basically sort of wrote all this great stuff about how Stalin's economy was wonderful and S Soviet Union under Stalin was great. And the, wall, uh, the, the, the uh, New York Times, I think, retracted it like last year or something. Like 50 years later, they finally retract it. So the left, though, will tell you, well, it's not, we're not for Hitler anymore. We're not for Stalin. We're not for the, well, we kind of want so socialism without the gulag, basically, without the Holocaust, without the killing of millions of people. But I taught a course on the dystopian novel about a year or two ago. And in that, we, uh, we read 1984, but then we read some of the precursors, Brave New World, Anthem by Ayn Rand, Back to We, which is a great book if you haven't read. It's uh, written in the 1920s. And we went all the way back to Dostoevsky. And one of the questions the kids kept asking was, they said, well, this, and then we see Stalin, and this, and these ideas, and dystopia, is violence inherent? You know, is violence inherent to socialism? And this still is an important question because the left now wants to tell you that they're not for the authoritarianism, therefore a kinder, gentler form of socialism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kelly, I, you, I think you have a, you were an English major, you've been in communications your whole professional life. Between you and the senator, you have three sons, is that right? Yes. So you have a, <clears throat> a stake in this because I'm sure, I think you, you co-wrote this book involved heavily in the research and you have three boys that are growing up in a community of people where half of their friends might feel they're socialist or they should be socialist. Uh, what did you learn about as you as, as you as the senator went forward to write this? I think we were talking beforehand about the Scandinavian countries and the, the, uh, the Americans' perception of what socialism is like there and what we might have here. We, sure. Yes, yeah, so Rand had written a lot of the sort of the philosophy behind socialism based on that course that he taught at George Washington, and he had written all the chapters on the history of it. And then that's when I got involved. Uh, she and came started. involved to make it interesting, all right? It was kind of getting dry, and I said, can you help me with this book? Yeah. But so often now, um, you know, in our public discourse and with the leading candidates on the Democrat side, they frequently invoke Scandinavia. You hear Denmark, you hear Sweden. Why can't we do these things? You know, I think Bernie has described Denmark as his sort of socialist nirvana so often that the president of Denmark actually, in a speech, said, please stop calling us socialists. We are not a socialist country. We have nothing but capitalism here. Uh, but I think a lot of people get these ideas about them because they did dabble in outright socialism in about the 70s and 80s. They were, uh, Sweden, for example, was the fourth richest country in the world. And then they went into a terrible economic malaise in the 90s after their socialist policies of the 70s and 80s. They did uh, have a lot of punitive wealth taxes at that point. And guess what happened? The wealthy fled. The founder of IKEA, the furniture giant, he fled. Bjorn Borg. I mean, they they then they took their capital with them, and so they kind of, you know, sunk down into this terrible economic state, and they started repealing and have been ever since a lot of those policies. Uh, they still do have a very large welfare state, but they are a capitalist country, both they're all the Scandinavian countries have very low corporate taxes. Pretty much everything that Elizabeth Warren and Bernie are saying that they would do or change if they got elected, they don't do very much of those things in Scandinavia. So they had very low corporate taxes, much lower than ours until the uh, Trump tax cuts lowered our corporate taxes last year. Uh, no minimum wage. They no longer have punitive wealth taxes. Uh, that what they do have and what the left doesn't really want to talk about very much is extremely high taxes on the middle class because it's really a mathematics problem. They do have nationalized health service and they have free college tuition, but they accomplish that with two things primarily. Number one is a 25% sales tax on virtually, well really on everything they buy. A dozen eggs, a pair of jeans, any item, and it's applied all along the production chain. So I don't know if anyone in here has traveled to Scandinavia lately, but if you have, it's insanely expensive. And of course, the lower income you are, 
the vast majority of your income goes to your consumption. So that amounts to being a very regressive tax on the poorer people in those countries. Uh, and also the middle class taxes kick in at about $60,000, you're paying 60% income tax, 60%. So that's kind of not what they're telling. They keep saying soak the rich, you know, the rich aren't paying their fair share, but I'll just give you one other statistic. In Sweden, for example, their top 1% pay about 25%, about a quarter of the overall income taxes of Sweden, their top one. Our top 1% pays 40% of our total. So their tax system is actually much more regressive than the United States. They're not really telling the whole story. And that's kind of what I wanted to get across in, in the book. That's fine if that's what you want, but you have to realize how it is actually paid for. It's a, it's a math problem. And but I, you, have, you have to be honest about this. I mean, this is the thing is, we're being offered this by Bernie Sanders and AOC and all the socialists, and they tell you, oh, but we're just gonna tax the rich people. We're not gonna tax any of you. We're just gonna tax the top 1%. Well, you add up their taxes and you get like $50 billion in taxes. And it sounds like a lot of money, but their spending wants are like $60 trillion. So it's like, hmm, there's a decimal problem here. <laughs> Trillions versus billions. And so it is a big lie. And it's easy to sell you, we're going to give you all this so-called free stuff, and I'm not going to tax any of you. I'm just going to tax those rich people. You don't even know these rich people. They're so rich, you've never even met these rich people. But that's what we're going to do. But it's a lie. And then he says, oh, that, you know, we're going to give you Swedish socialism and Scandinavian socialism. It's a lie. They're not socialists. They have private property. They have a stock market. They have free trade. When you have economic indexes that look at Scandinavian countries, what you actually find is they're in the top 10 of uh, free trading countries around the world. They do have a big welfare state. But as Kelly said, they pay for it by high taxes on the working class and high taxes on the middle class. And that's why this question they're asking Elizabeth Warren is important. Of course, now she doesn't admit she's a socialist. She's like the good old liberals in the old days who wouldn't admit it. <laughs> but she really isn't that much different than Bernie Sanders. Their policies are the same. And she's for this Medicare for all that they admit will cost 30 trillion, we think will cost 60 trillion. All right, 30, 60, let's just say a lot of money. And, uh, but Elizabeth Warren, they're asking her this question, how are you gonna pay for it? And she doesn't want to admit it because it may not be that popular to say, oh, well, it isn't just the rich people, it's all of you guys. Everybody's gonna have to pay for it because of the, the, the middle class votes. And do you really wanna tell the middle class you're gonna get all this so-called free stuff, but you're really gonna have to pay a 60% income tax? The other thing that, that we talk about in the book, too, is that our countries are just so very different. So, you know, even, you know, Rand was on The View this past week trying to have a reason. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't ever do it again. <laughs> And I think that I'm unedifying. <laughs> a few a, a few months ago, they were they were debating socialism on the show, and they were once again bringing up you know Denmark, for example, and just all the uh, the lifestyle numbers and the metrics that they're they're fitter, they're healthier, they're happier on the happiest happiness index, and so. You know, I think even Hillary Clinton once did say to Bernie, we're not Denmark. I mean, their country is incredibly cohesive, culturally, racially. Um, I, I have to laugh every time people bring up their happiness scale. They usually show a picture of a really handsome Dane. They're so fit, they're on their bikes, right? Don't you always see pictures of the Danish, the young Danish on their bikes? They're so much fitter than we are, they're happier. And I'm like, yeah, do you know why they're always on their bikes? Because they have a 200% tax on cars. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. So my, I interviewed, I have a close personal friend who is a, a Danish journalist, and she lives part of the time in the US and part of the time over there, so she was a great source for me. I quote her a lot in the book. And uh, she did say, though, that they are actually becoming more what she described as classically liberal over there, which is more, they, that's the term they use for capitalist. And she said they actually had elected enough libertarians last year to get that 200% car tax down to a, just a reasonable 100%, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's where they but, are right but now. The, sort of the lie of some of the statistics is this. So basically they said, well, they live longer and they have lower infant mortality. And they said, that's what socialized medicine will get you. But if you look at it, 100 years ago, before they had socialism, before they had nationalized healthcare, they lived longer and had lower infant mortality. There are other reasons for it. And uh, if you look at income, and this is, there's a famous uh, Milton Friedman story where he says, uh, the Swedish economist is saying, well, you know, we have no poverty in Sweden. 
And Milton Friedman looks at me and says, well, you know, we have no poverty among Swedish Americans in America. <laughs> <laughs> and it is the point. It's not easily explained, but something's going on. I mean, I don't know if it's work ethic or family or something, but Swedish Americans score higher than other sort of ethnic groups that you look at. And it isn't a consequence of socialism. It isn't a consequence of welfareism. It's uh, just basically based on uh, culture. You know, Senator, in just a few weeks, uh, I'm heading to Berlin. Um, uh, Secretary Pompeo is going to unveil a statue of President Reagan there. Um, and it's all time to be um, during the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I wonder if you think that uh, perhaps this uh, drift, especially amongst our youth, uh, towards socialism is built upon the fact that you, you have to be 30 years old or more to even have been alive when the Berlin Wall stood. Right. Uh, and so maybe there's just maybe a lack of recognition or understanding or consciousness about what communism was, for example. I think it's lack of memory, lack of knowledge of history, and I might blame the government schools a little bit for that. Yeah. But, but it, it, it's more than that. So the socialists like socialism until they don't like socialism, until they see the gulag, until they see people eating their pets and starvation, they're, they're fine with it. So Venezuela, Oliver Stone, can we, can we speak Ill, Ill of Oliver Stone here? <laughs> uh, Oliver Stone wrote two of these biopics on uh, Chavez. He was so great, they were eliminating poverty and socialism was so good in Venezuela until it wasn't. I mean, they're starving in Venezuela now. The average Venezuelan lost 20 pounds. But if you think that there's not a top 1% under, under socialism, look at the size of Maduro, all right? <laughs> the guy's got to be 50 pounds over. He must wear like a 70 size jacket or something. You're well fed if you're the dear leader or if you're friends with the dear leader. Socialism has a top 1%, but theirs is based completely on cronyism, whereas ours, not maybe completely and maybe not perfectly, but for the most part, ours is based on merit. You become wealthy in our country by selling something that somebody wants to buy. Sam Walton didn't use government. He sold something that somebody wanted to buy and he became wealthy. And that's, I think, the majority of the stories. We're not perfect, but the majority of stories in our country. And so when they get to Venezuela, though, the people are like, oh, no, thou, that's not the socialism we want anymore. We want Scandinavia. So we have to follow their arguments, even though they're nonsensical arguments. We have to follow their arguments because that's what this is about. It's about combating their arguments and making sure we have an answer for each one of them. And I think we can beat them intellectually. We always have. We have always kicked their butt intellectually, and we should continue to do it. Yeah. Uh, you, I think one of the chapters of your book is entitled uh, Socialism Rewards Corruption. How, um, tell me about that. Well, others have talked about this, Hayek and others, and it's sort of the question of whether or not um, state violence and authoritarianism is, a, is, a, uh, is something that is inherent to socialism or an accident. And so if you look at history, it seems like we keep getting authoritarians. You know, you got Hitler, Mao, Pol Pot, Chavez, Castro. It just keeps going on and on. And so what, what Hayek and others wrote was that they said, when you get to complete socialism, if complete socialism is the state owning the means of production or the state owning all of the property, well, somebody else already owns it. So you've got to take it from them. And so if you want to vote in you know, Bernie Sanders, the kinder, gentler socialist, well, guess what? He probably won't be very efficient at taking the land. So what happens is when you get socialism, if you really want it, you have to have someone ruthless enough to kill the people on the land. And that's what happened. And it happened time and time again. But it's also more than that. And this is what we shouldn't let them get away with. They say, oh, we just want, we just want the world to be fair. We want people to be equal. But realize that people aren't equal. And if we all want equal outcome, if we give you all $1,000 and I send you out in the hall for 10 minutes, Somebody's going to start trading something. You'll come back in. Somebody's going to have 1500 bucks, and somebody's going to have 500 bucks because people are hustling and having ideas. I give you a week, and it's going to be completely unequally distributed. But if we want to distribute it equally, if I want to come back and equalize all of you, whether you work hard or not, I have to treat you unequally. 
And this is one of the things that's a little more subtle, but that we need to talk to the left about. The left believes, as we also believe, in equal protection under the law. The law should be absolutely blind, and it should be absolutely treats everybody equal. We don't care what color you are, what race you are, what religion you are, what gender you are. The, the, you should be treated with equal protection. But if we want equal outcomes, we actually have to flip the law on its head, and we have to treat you unequally. So I think there is a sort of a fairness argument we can talk to them about that to equalize people goes against the nature of man, but it also is an unequal treatment of people that really goes against the idea of equal protection. Um, for either of you, uh, our concern at the Reagan Foundation on this, this socialism front is, uh, you know, by the time when kids go off to college and there's plenty of liberal professors and socialism rules a day is that we try to maybe help educate high schoolers before they even get there so they might defend capitalism. And, and uh, so we're going to be giving them uh, lots of courses on Reaganomics. And, uh, and I, I wonder, you know, Kelly, what language would you use? What, what is it that needs to be said to kids in their teens, to those before they go off to college? Is, you know, uh, you know, I just think it's really important for people to understand that the more of your liberty that you give up to the state, the more control that they have over you. So one of the things that I tell a lot of young people who are interested in the idea of free tuition, because that is, you know, it's, we do have insanely expensive tuition now in our country. And as Rand said when he was on The Daily Show last week, he, uh, Trevor Noah, pointed out the two areas in our country that are the most expensive, health care and tuition. And guess what? Those are the two areas that the government has the most control of in our country. But one of the things that I try to point out to people when I talk about tuition is that, you, yes, in Denmark and Sweden, they have free college tuition. However, you need to understand that when the state is paying for it, they have a great deal of control over what you study and who gets to study it. So, for example, um, pol political science is a very popular major. A lot of kids study it. I took a ton of poli-sci. You know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was like, oh, take poli-sci, blah, blah, blah. In Denmark, uh, you have to, because they don't need very many political scientists, the, the state, they only accept the top 10%. You pretty much have to have great, it's more competitive than medical school to study political science. So unless you have the grades, you will be directed <laughs> into a subject that they need you to study. And it, you know, and it may be a trade. So you give up some of your freedom there. It's not, while it is free, it's n the actual numbers of people who go to college are not dissimilar from that in the United States because uh, you may not have, the, you know, a lot of the kids who are stuck with sort of worthless degrees now and say they can't get a job, they wouldn't have that over there because they wouldn't have been spending four years studying something that didn't didn't. Allow and it's the same whether it's whether it's college or whether it's healthcare. If it's free, too many people want it. Everybody shows up because it's free. So how do you control the line? Well, you have to form a line, so you have to get in line. But then the rules will have to be promulgated by the state. The state's going to have to say who gets to be here in the line, here in the line, here in the line, because too many people come. And the great thing about the marketplace is, is that supply and demand are always readjusting. So if you go to Walmart and you buy three items in Walmart, you buy razors and toothpaste and something else, a T-shirt, it's immediately scanned and somewhere back Sam, Sam Walton's brain is, you know, we need more toothpaste. We, you know, it's immediately happening. But in education, it doesn't happen that way. So the, I get people, uh, they come to lobby me all the time, all the students, they want more grants, they want more loans, they want more free college. And I was like, well, why don't we try to bring the price of college down rather than just giving you more money to give to the colleges? And I tell them, well, you know, there's supply and demand. If the demand is higher, you gotta bring the supply up. And there, there actually are ways you could do it in college. We have it, and it really is uh, via the amazing thing of the internet. If you transmit knowledge and you're the first student, it costs the, the, you know, the amount to set the system up. By the time you get to the million student, it's almost zero. So the price of education should approach zero at some point. Interestingly, all the state colleges, and really most of the private colleges too, but the state colleges charge the same whether you show up in class or whether you get online education. In fact, the Obama administration tried to put all the online schools out of business because they were competing with the state schools. But here's what they did. Uh, one of them, they beat it up so much and they investigated it that the stock price went from $70 to 
who bought it, two Obama officials that were part of beating <laughs> it up. But, but it is part of the answer, and it's the same way with health care. The individual market's broken. If you're, if you're in a small business or by yourself and you're family buying insurance, the rates are going up 25 to 50 percent a year. So what do we do? We give you money through Obamacare to feed the curve. But the curve, if it's already up like this, the curve goes higher. If you want the curve to go lower, we have to somehow either increase the supply or allow the people who are demanding health care to organize to get prices down. I promise you that one change could completely transform the problem in health care. It would involve no government. That is letting you buy your insurance through Costco or Sam's Club. You know, Senator, if I close my eyes and just listen to you, and I feel like I'm back in the 1980s from the speaking. That was the day and age when Republicans cared about the deficit. And I, I just, are you like the last fiscal conservative left in Washington, D.C.? There's one other in the Senate, Mike Lee. Yeah, Mike Lee. Um, but it is sad. And it, it's probably a few more than that. I, I, I'm, being, I'm being mean. But I would say that when you look at it, I introduce the penny plan budget every year. I've been doing it for four or five years. We'd cut 1% out of every dollar, and it balances in five years. And the interesting thing is, when groups come that want money, which is every group, essentially, that comes to Washington, I call them the beseechers. They have their hands out, (laughs) and they want money. But a lot of them are like, well, you know, my father has Alzheimer's or hemophilia. It's always, or diabetes. It's something that is heart-wrenching. You're like, well, couldn't we help you? And I look at them, and I say, well, last year we gave you $100 million. Could you settle for $99 million? And you know what? Even the liberals independents, you name it, these are people who work for government and want more government money. They say, well, you know what if everybody did? But interestingly, nobody in Washington, so I put it forward, no Democrat will vote for it. So what I usually say is the Democrats do not care, absolutely do not care about the deficit. The Republicans all pretend to care, and we get about 20 votes in the Senate, and about 30 will oppose it. A little over 30 oppose it, and these are your big government Republicans, and until we replace them, we can't even really be the party that's against deficits anymore because, look, you all, what did we say to you? We came to you and we said, we, give us the House, give us the Senate, give us the presidency, and we'll do something about the debt. And the debt got worse because the Republicans, too many of them, have been there too long. Yeah. 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 The Senator, you talked, uh, in, you, you spoke there about the, the one penny and um, the 1% plan. Um, there was also a point you made in your book about under capitalism, you know, everyone always goes after the top 1%, the top 1%, and you make a point that that 1% is always changing under capitalism. Walter Williams has been great in talking about this, that it's not the same people. So if you look at people who make a million dollars a year, I think nine, uh, six to 9% will make a million dollars every year for the next 10 years. So a small number, people going in and out of it. There aren't as many young people. There are a few young people who are in the top 1%. That's because you're just getting started. So you gain wealth with each decade of work, and most of the people in the top 1% have been around a while. But it's different people. If you're born in the bottom 20%, um, 60% of people born in the bottom 20%, meaning they're relatively poor, the poorest 20%, 60% of them make it out of the bottom 20%. A third of those born in the bottom 20% actually make the top 10%. So people are going up and down all the time. And the thing is, this is the real rub. This is, uh, of all the different lies from the socialists, this is the biggest lie that the pie is one size, that the economic pie is not getting bigger. It's doubled eight times in the last 200 years. The economic pie is growing like gangbusters. It's the best time ever to be alive. And the rich are getting richer, the middle class are getting richer, the poor are getting richer. And when Bernie says the middle class is being decimated, yes, because they're going to the upper class. (laughs) <laughs> if you want to look at how well we're doing, there's a couple, uh, humanprogress.org is uh, associated with Cato, and they do a wonderful job of, of, of looking at the statistics. A hundred years ago, a person wanted to buy a basket of, of food for a certain amount of average hours. They got one basket of food. The same average hours, adjusted for inflation, they get seven times as much food. 
So a person in 1919 was spending over a third of their income on food is now spending about 12% on food. This is based on an average worker. Average worker. Yeah. Same with a refrigerator. So you go to a refrigerator in the 1950s, took 150 hours for the average worker to get a refrigerator, and now it's like 12. It's an amazing 16, time. But who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> if you look at poverty, poverty, uh, according to the World Bank, $2 a day, less than $2 a day. This is extreme poverty. In 1820, beginning of the Industrial Revolution, everybody lived that way, and they had since the beginning of time. Every, the, the normal life of the human on the planet is subsistence and poverty until you get to the Industrial Revolution. 90% of the people lived in extreme poverty at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. When I was born in the early 1960s, only a third of people lived in extreme poverty. Same constant dollars, looking at it with the same statistics. Today, it's less than 10%. So when people come up to me and say, oh, woe is me, I'm, how could I ever get ahead, you know, how could I ever get started? And we had John Mackey come talk one time, and with $10,000, he turned it into a billion-dollar uh, uh, store, Whole Foods. And some girl in the audience said, oh, how could I ever get $10,000? <laughs> and it's like, really, you can earn, ten, and I'm not saying it's easy, but you could earn $10,000 mowing lawns as a high school kid and start a business, and you could be John Mackey, but you got to believe in the system, you got to believe in America, and believe in your own talent. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to... Fast forward to present day politics for a minute, but I'll give you context for it. Whether it's your 1% plan or doing something about shrinking the deficit, attacking federal spending, keeping tax rates low, et cetera, all these things um, with this threat, this cloud of impeachment now hanging over not just the president, but all of Washington, is it going to be possible to get absolutely anything done in the next year? Hmm. No. <laughs> Pro probably not. I think it's going to end up being a partisan exercise is what I think happens. I think that um, particularly if the real issue is about uh, did w one person decide to try to influence aid to Ukraine uh, to target certain types of people or persons for corruption, well, that would be everybody in Washington has been doing that. I mean, Joe Biden did that. He wanted to stop a prosecutor. Um, three U.S. senators sent a letter there about a year ago, and they said, if you don't continue to investigate Trump under the Mueller investigation for Trump collusion, we may just reconsider our bipartisan support for Ukrainian aid. What well, sounds to me like the Democrats are threatening and making aid quid pro quo to behavior. And so I think really in the end, there is a certain sense of the people who wants people to be treated equally. So for example, I really don't want to put Joe Biden in there for getting his son this gravy job, $50,000 a month, although maybe I might have voted to impeach him, I don't know. But the thing is, is that if we're going to be fair, what he did, there's something that doesn't pass the smell test about his kid making $50,000 a month. But I think people will look at that and say, well, he did this. Those senators are threatening the aid. There was a senator there last month, a Democrat senator, who said, if you do investigate Hunter Biden, I may reconsider my support for your aid. Here's my point. If I had been on the phone with the president of UK, I would say, we have no money. <laughs> We're not going to borrow any more money from China to send it to Ukraine. <laughs> Uh, you're probably in a truly unique position because as a United States senator, if the impeachment goes, moves forward, you end up uh, essentially a member of the jury, right? So are all members of the Senate just keeping their powder dry and you're, you know, you're not discussing? Uh, I think it'll be a purely partisan vote. I think all the Democrats will vote to impeach if they have the vote in the House. And I think all the Republicans will vote uh, not to impeach in the Senate. Now, some may say, oh, we're going to treat it as a trial, but I know what the trial is about. It's already been aired. There would have to be something so different that completely changes the situation for me to change. And so I'm just going to say it. I can't see a way that I could vote for impeachment. Mm -hmm. uh Uh, impeachment, uh, legal, political matter. Uh, Kelly, uh, while we're on the subject of crime and those sorts of things, 
Um, this topic of criminal justice reform has been important to both of you, and I know you've, you've spoken to this issue and been quite involved in it. Kelly, do you want to talk about why you see that as important? Yes, yes um, I'm on the board of a criminal justice reform group, and I was very involved in um, a lot of the lobbying for the First Step Act, which was passed, um, really trying to correct some of the, the problems that came about with the 94 crime bill, um, which was that Clinton crime bill, which had really resulted in a hugely disproportionate number of African Americans and poor people being incarcerated. Um, it is kind of a frightening thing to think about our country, the home of the free and liberty, being the most heavily incarcerated, one of the most heavily incarcerated countries in the world after like North Korea or something. It's terrible. We've had like a 700% increase in incarceration rates since the early 90s, and most of it is for nonviolent drug offenses. Uh, the war on drugs really resulted in a huge numbers of people being incarcerated for nonviolent crimes, many of which were, you know, now marijuana, which is now legal. So there's a, a huge injustice in that, and a lot of people really got on board with that and looking at what was happening. Uh, things like the mandatory minimums, where people were, be, were being given decades-long sentences for nonviolent drug offenses. Um, you look at the disparity between someone who is, you know, upper socioeconomic and someone who is poor caught using drugs, the poor person is more likely to go to jail or to languish waiting, you know, can't pay bail and is going to languish for months. And frankly, you may not go into prison nonviolent, but you may come out that way. And we were seeing that this was really not enhancing our safety. So I got really involved with this. And I have to say, you know, the passage of that law I think really corrected a lot, and I hope we're going to see a lot more good coming of that. But President Trump and the Republicans deserve a lot of credit for it, and you never hear this. And this was completely bipartisan. Um, it was sponsored in the House by Hakeem Jeffries, you know, a liberal Democrat from New York, and uh, Congressman Collins, a conservative Republican from Georgia. Everyone worked together. We had everybody from Van Jones to Jared Kushner with this coalition. And, and got it done. And um, I've become personal friends with a couple of people that have been released under the First Step Act. And I see the good that they're doing. And I see the way that they are really trying to advocate for ending some of this injustice. And I think that um, President Trump deserves more credit for it than he has gotten. Um. A number of our um, members of the audience have uh, been kind enough to uh, put some questions together, and I'm going to throw a few at you um, here. Uh, and they're, they, they focus a lot on current events. Uh, what, and this one I, the audience is going to appreciate. What can Republicans do to win back California and the other <laughs> West Coast states? <laughs> I can't believe people are chuckling like that would be difficult, right? That somehow that's going to be hard. Oh, you know, when I was running for president, I thought we needed a different kind of Republican to win California back, and I still kind of think that. Um, I don't know exactly how we get there, though, and I think that part of the problem is um, that we need to be... Uh, I don't know the best way to put it. We, we've got to be a party that's more accepting of people that we want in our party. And that means whether you're African American, Asian American, whatever ethnic group you sort of fit into, we need to let people know they're welcome in our party. If you're new to our country, if you've come here legally and you're obeying the laws and you want to work, we want you here. And we have to have a better attitude because if we just simply say that we're not going to go after the Hispanic vote, we're not going to go after the African American vote or the Indian American vote, there are all these sort of new people to our country, and California has a lot of them, and they have a bad perception of us. So I'm not even saying it's about policy. You know, it isn't really, I don't think you have to say, oh, we're for open borders to get the Hispanic vote. I think a lot of people are here think you still should have some rules because I have a job paying $10 an hour and I may make $5 an hour if 3 million people come all at once. There have to be some, some regulation of the border. But I think if people think you, they don't, that you don't like them, they won't ever vote for you. That's, a, that's one thing I can say. Um, but I don't know if it's, you're going to have to figure this out yourself. You've got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, another from an audience member. Um, what are your views of the upcoming 
Democrats running for president, uh, and what are President Trump's chances of winning? I think they're making it easier on him. <laughs> I do think that one of the things that they're going to have to defend, and if it's Elizabeth Warren, she is going to rue the day that she came out for Medicare for All. And here's the reason. It's Medicare for All and private insurance for none. Who has some of the best insurance in our country? Union workers. So if the union workers in Michigan and Ohio and Pennsylvania wake up and discover that the Democrats are coming for your gold-plated, really, really good health insurance, and you're going to wind up standing in a line with the Medicare line, my guess is we might get a lot of the union voting. It could make a big difference in about three or four states. So I've been telling the Trump campaign, you need to make sure that they know that this Medicare for all sounds like good free stuff for everybody, but really in the end, they're going to take something you like better and gives you something that you may not like. Um, Kelly, I have the honor of serving on uh, Gary Sinise's foundation board. Uh, all about veterans and wounded veterans and everything this country needs to do to support them. And I know you have been involved in the um, Helping a Hero um, mm -hmm. effort. Can you talk about that? Uh, sure. Uh, I got involved with that organization, gosh, it's probably been six or seven years ago, when uh, I got a phone call from a man in our town who owned uh, the local Minute Mart and a young girl who had worked for him for years was married to a soldier who had uh, stepped on an IED on a mission in Afghanistan. Um, and this soldier had lost both of his legs and an arm, 23 years old, and they had a new baby. And um, this very kind businessman was like, my heart is breaking, what can we do for this family? And so um, I got involved. I, made some phone calls and there was an organization called Helping a Hero and um, got a lot of people in our community to just sort of welcome this, this soldier home. He'd had multiple surgeries. He was in Texas at the time with his young wife. And our entire community really rallied around. We had an incredible fundraiser. Um, and through Helping a Hero, uh, they build homes for catastrophically wounded soldiers. So. The, the whole idea is that um, if, 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 you don't, if you can't wake up in the morning and take a shower or hand, do everything in your kitchen, then your spouse becomes your caregiver. And the, these homes are smart homes. Everything is designed for someone, whether it's in a wheelchair. We worked on another one for another Kentucky soldier who's blind. The houses are all designed so that these heroes can come home and resume their lives. And it was a really powerful experience for me working on it. I remember walking through that house right after it was finished and uh, the general contractor who had donated all of his effort on his own told me um, what a, an experience it was for him as well and to get to know Sergeant Williams, this incredibly patriotic and heroic young man and his wife who just had no ill feelings, were ready to just embrace their life and move on even though it had been so altered. And as I'm walking through the house, the builder who's sort of this big burly guy, he caught really emotional. He said, you know, the, uh, the roofers and some of the painters and some of the guys that were laying the floor wouldn't let me pay them for this house. They said, you know, I just want you to take my pay and put it toward the next house for the next soldier. And this builder looked at me and he said, I, I feel like God's hands are all over this house. And in that moment, you know, I really did too. And I'm just very, I'm very passionate about this. I'm, you know, I'm also hoping for the day that we are not involved in so many wars, that we don't see these young men, because I look at them every day and it breaks. And they are, they are, they are so patriotic and they wanted to, and I want us to do right by them by not putting them in harm's way when our own interests are not. And I would say this is one of the misconceptions from my point of view of Ronald Reagan. People think, oh, he was this cowboy and he was accused of being this you know, guy that was just going to unleash nuclear weapons and everything. And if you listen to him, he had a profound a sort of worry about nuclear war. And he did something that if you did it today, they'd say, oh, you're working for the Soviet Union. He talked to, he talked to Gorbachev. 
And it's like, now if you want to talk to anybody, it's like all of a sudden you're accepting everything they believe in and you're a terrible person. Ronald Reagan had the courage. People believed and knew that he believed in strong defense, but he actually talked to Gorbachev. We, we need more of that now. And I think Ronald Reagan's foreign policy was actually much more realistic of the way the world was than the way he was painted in history. And some of the people who are out there now, some of the Republicans, Lindsey Graham, uh, <laughs> They would have been critical of Ronald Reagan, too. They're criticizing Trump now, but they would have been critical of Ronald Reagan, too, and many of them did. Many of them did not want him to talk to Gorbachev, and many of them uh, criticized the decision after the bombing in, in Beirut to decide there really wasn't a, uh, a cause for us in the Lebanon civil war. Um, an audience member question fits right into what you're saying there, uh, Senator. Um, the question is, does a president really control foreign policy, or do you see an encroachment by special interests, the kind that uh, President Eisenhower worried about in his farewell address? I think there's some of that. What we do is we take the weapons that we make, and we do need weapons. I'm, I'm for having a strong national defense. I'm for having the strongest and best technology. But we divide them up into like 40 different congressional districts to make sure they always get passed. And so there is, and I don't think these are bad people necessarily, but they're playing sort of the system where there's a self-interest because the, the 500 jobs are in your district. You know what I mean? And so sometimes things may get built because of the 500 jobs instead of because they're the best weapon. Um, it's difficult. And for the most part, I think defense decisions on weapons are something that we decide the amount, but I'm not an expert in exactly which plane. I know we have oversight on it, but I think we want some of the uh, experts in the military to tell us which plane, which missile, which missile needs to be upgraded and things like that. Um, but I think that uh, sometimes we are making decisions not necessarily in, in a wise fashion. Over who controls it, the president or special interest? The president does, and this is a change from what our founding fathers really were for. The founding fathers really, and this, this is something that I think is very important for us to understand. When we break with uh, King George, it isn't the beginning of something brand new. Our American Revolution wasn't a brand new thing. It was a continuation of the English Revolution and the English uh, desire to restrict the power of the king, which really begins in 1215 with the Magna Carta, and it goes on. It's, we're part of that same system, but when we got to our Constitution, we said we don't want a king, but not only did we not want a hereditary king, we didn't want a strong president. So we, uh, Thomas Jefferson describes it as, uh, we bound the government with the chains of the Constitution, Madison put it this way, he said, the executive is the branch most prone to war, therefore, with studied care, we vested that power in the legislature. We haven't really done it that way for a long time. Truman was the first president sort of just to decide to go to a big war. A lot of the presidents had gone into skirmishes, but Truman was the first one to take us to a big war that wasn't voted on. Um, I wasn't for the Iraq war, but Bush did do the right thing in coming to Congress, and we did vote for it. This is a question I have to people now about Syria. Number one, I want to meet the general who thinks it's a good idea to have 50 troops in front of 10,000. <laughs> part, part of the problem is, is people hate Trump so much, this Trump derangement syndrome. Most of the Democrats were against the Iraq war. Now they're for putting us in the middle of the Syrian war. It's completely insane. Do I care about the Kurds? Sure. I actually have been in favor of a, a Iraqi Kurdistan or Iraqi Kurdish area. And it's worked out. It's not perfect. They don't have their own country, but they have a semi-autonomous area. And interestingly, the Iraqi Kurds actually do trade with the uh, uh, Turkish businesses. There's 1,800 businesses that do business in Iraqi, uh, the Kurdish area. So for the last eight years of this terrible civil war, we've been saying, Lindsey Graham, and others have been saying they want regime change. They want to get rid of Assad. And they say, well, Assad's a terrible guy. Well, yeah, but Erdogan's not a whole lot better. I'm not so sure, uh, you know, if I'm telling you I'm going to send your son or your daughter to war and you're going to fight for Assad or you're going to fight for Erdogan or we're going to fight against our NATO ally. The Free Syrian Army is also helping the Turks. They were allied with us for seven years. Here's my point is the Kurds' best chance for survival may just have occurred. And people don't get this yet. But I think their best chance for survival may be that they're now going to have a sponsor in Syria. We were never staying. The president said we were going to wipe out ISIS. 
And then the neocons say, well, you're going to wipe out ISIS. ISIS did all the fighting for America. And it's like, no, they didn't. They did the fighting for themselves. And we supported them with weapons and with lots of money and with weapons. But I think in the end, their best chance to have their own homeland is actually if we can have a conversation now between Assad and between Erdogan, if Assad can guarantee there's not going to be incursions from the Kurds back into, into, into Turkey, there might be a chance that they could have somewhat of a same thing they have in Iraq, in Syria. Nobody can predict for sure what's going to happen, but I do think leaving 50 soldiers in front of 10,000 is just a recipe for disaster. So I think the president made the wise, wise decision. Mm -hmm. We've got time for about two more questions. Uh, this one, another from the audience, and Kelly, I'll put this to you. It's how can we reverse the maleducation of our youth and promote objective education? Gosh, that's really hard. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I really don't know what to say. I mean, I feel like so many people have become very dissatisfied with their public school systems. I do think that um, it's almost hard to even speak out and talk about what you want anymore. You're just sort of shouted down from the other side. Um, one of the things that Rand and I have talked about, you know, we, there are a lot of homeschoolers that support us. We, we do believe in, you know, school choice and kind of voting with your feet to try to go somewhere else if you feel like your children are not being served where you are. Um, there's also great options now that didn't exist before because of technology um, with all of the things that you can get online, especially for subjects like, you know, physics and calculus and things that in the past, maybe if you lived in a rural area, you couldn't get access to those subjects. Now you can get like the best calculus teacher in the world, that Khan Academy or whatever, you can just get that in wherever you want. So. I don't know, I feel like people need more choice in, in where they go for their education, for their kids. Um, and unfortunately, we have so much pressure now, especially if you're in the lower so socioeconomic, you're told that you have to go to that school, and I don't think that's right. Senator. Um, it, uh, uh, the topic of privacy, I know it's I don't, you, you might be the most engaged and involved member of the United States Senate on that topic and the issues of privacy in the Patriot Act as we try to fight the war on terror. Can you talk to us about your role in that effort? I think a lot of this is also, and people will become more aware of it as they've seen uh, that we actually have some partisans in the intelligence community that may be eavesdropping on the president and others. And so it's made it more poignant for people who might not have been in, as engaged on this issue. But for example, I think what they did to General Flynn was awful. So part of his... <laughs> part of his job as a national security advisor is to talk to foreigners. So he's talking to the Russian ambassador. Now, I understand we will spy on foreigners, and I'm not saying we don't. But the thing is, and this is something I've talked to the president a lot about, and I'm trying to get him and Congress to fix is, we don't get a warrant to listen to them because they're foreigners. So if they're in Libya or Iraq and we listen to them, I'm actually okay with that. You don't get warrants to listen to foreigners, and we can scoop up everything. But if they talk to an American, you, it, the information has been gathered without a warrant. So it should be good for terrorism, national defense, and, and stopping if someone's committing treason. But if it's uh, a domestic crime, you shouldn't be allowed to use that information. And so what I've talked to the president about is, let's try to broaden this to be not just about what, that they've abused the president in the intelligence community, let's make it about all of us. That if, it, you know, if you do business in Europe or you do business in Asia or anywhere around the world, your phone call is being listened to. We don't just suck up just one or two phone calls. We can suck up every phone call that's going to Italy in a whole month. We can just suck up every phone call. And so it's an enormous amount of data and for a while, they weren't being honest with us. For a while, they were collecting all of our metadata. They weren't listening to your phone calls, but they were listening to your metadata. And some people have said that metadata is actually more important than your conversation, because we can tell who your doctor is. We can, we can actually infer what diseases you have by what doctors you go to. We can tell by the length of your conversation a lot of things. In fact, they've said that we actually have killed people based on metadata. Not in, the, not in our country, hopefully, but somewhere else we have killed people based on metadata. So we, we should do something about privacy, and it's in, the, it's in the Constitution. It's the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment says you've got to go to a public judge, you've got to prove probable cause or present an argument for probable cause, and then you're allowed to. 
So we can. We can go after murderers and rapists and all these people that we want to listen to their phones or come into their houses, but you have to get a warrant. Right now what we're doing is warrantless, and so we're doing it in this bulk nature, and it's alarming because ultimately it's going to stifle speech. If you know uh, that everybody knows uh, your conversations and what groups you belong to, it is really a, a, a potential for stifling speech. So we've had this argument, and after 9-11 we gave the government a lot of power, but here's the thing is, the intelligence community grew so strong that when Edward Snowden revealed that they were really collecting all of your metadata, it was a week after James Clapper went to a Senate committee and told Ron Wyden, we are not collecting this. He looked at the Senate committee and he lied. And is anybody surprised now that James Clapper is a big voice talking about glo uh, climate change and climate you know, alarmism? Have you seen how hateful these people have been? These people had so much power. They had the power to listen to every one of your phone calls. Clapper, Brennan, Comey, and they've turned out just to be incredible partisans. And that's bad enough, but think about the power they had. So my point is, power corrupts. And the thing is, we have to make sure it's not just about getting the right person, because our side could do it. You know, you can get bad people there that use these powers. So what you have to do is you have to contain the power. We need to make it very hard to listen to an American's phone call conversation, and it just should be done constitutionally. You should ask a judge first for permission. There's a final question from an audience member. This, kind of need, this is kind of a Ron Paul question and a Rand Paul question. I've seen this before, and I know you're an expert on this. What's the status of auditing the Fed? And uh, <laughs> I think we need my dad back in the house. <laughs> yes. He probably single-handedly brought attention to the Fed, and he's been, you know, studying and looking at the Federal Reserve and what a central bank does to a country. And to my mind, the way I look at the Federal Reserve, the question is, do they cause the problem or does Congress cause the problem? It's a little bit of both. The Federal Reserve finances the debt. Without the Federal Reserve, we couldn't run up this massive debt. Now, that might be a good thing, that we couldn't run up a massive debt. So you say, well, state governments, for the most part, balance their budget. They still have all these pension problems. I know California's got them. We've got them in Kentucky. But most of the time, the budget, and you'll, even in a state with a lot of debt, the budget supposedly is balanced because they don't have a central bank. So a central bank facilitates the ability to spend money you don't have. The other thing a central bank does is that as new money is created, the people who get it first are the very wealthy people that deal with the banking system. And so some people argue that it's sort of a form of crony capitalism that you're transferring money away from. So for example, if you're a regular person and you're not that sophisticated in your investments, you traditionally you used to be able to put money in banks or buy a CD and you might be able to get, you know, at various times in our history, five or six percent, you know, leaving your money in a bank. The reason it's 2% has nothing to do with the marketplace. It has to do with the government's trying to keep the interest rate cheap, you know, so we can continue to spend so much money. And one of the things where I think conservatives fall down, because a lot of conservatives actually are, are, love the Federal Reserve and don't want to audit it, and the establishment Republicans are really against it. But here's the point. Venezuela is failing because of price controls. And I had this argument with a uh, uh, Joseph Stiglitz. I think we tell it in the book. He's a you know, uh, won the Nobel Prize in economics, and who am I? I'm just a doctor, you know? And so I'm, I'm talking to him, and I was like, here's the point. You need the, the, an interest rate is the signal whether you're built too much or built too few. It's whether your economy's heating up or too much. It needs to go up and down like a price. So the same way the Soviet Union failed because they set the price of bread, there's a chance that ultimately we're gonna distort our economy so much that we have massive dislocations and corrections because we're controlling the price of money. And what should happen is, like in 2005, 6, 7, as we were building more houses and more people were competing for the money, the price of money should have risen. But then as the price of money rises, interest rates, then less houses will be built. It's the signal you've overbuilt. It's a signal to slow down. But we don't get it now. It just stays at 2%. Now they're talking about negative interest rates. If you get rid of interest rates, I think you may get rid of, you know, if we have negative interest rates, you may get rid of the... I think one of the most important signals in the marketplace to tell us whether we've built too much or built too little, we slow down or speed up. And so auditing the Federal Reserve is a first step. We've gotten close to 50 votes on it. We're missing a few Republicans. We need a few more Republicans. Um, interestingly, the only Democrat we got, we got Bernie Sanders. <laughs> oh, that's a great way to end it. <laughs> 
We had to say something nice about him because <laughs> in the case against socialism, he does figure prominently and not so well. Yeah, <laughs> he sure does. Uh, I, I, I hope that as many of you as possible can stick around, um, shake the senator's hand and his lovely wife Kelly's hand uh, at the book signing we're having right after. I read the book last week. It's just, it's fantastic. And if you want a solid education on socialism and the case against it, it's a really terrific read. Senator thank Kelly, thank you so much thank for you. coming. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay seated as Senator Rand Paul leaves the building to get ready for the book signing in the museum store. You may purchase his book outside these doors or at our museum store. Thank you for attending and we hope to see you again.